Okay, everyone. Uh, I'm Salunas Nicole Bay. I'm the uh, enrollment director for Strozzi Institute. I'm really excited that you all have joined us today, this evening. I'm not sure what time it is where you're uh, zooming in from. And for those who are on uh, Facebook Live, thank you for taking the time to just jump in to this conversation. We're really excited to um, provide this as a service. We know that many of you are um, negotiating and navigating some uncertainty, especially around your business and professional lives. And we wanted to just take this time to have a chat around the kind of practices and things that we can do in order to bring us back to center. Um, I'm more than pleased to uh, <laughs> introduce, uh, for those who don't know, Dr. Richard Strozzi Heckler, who is the founder of Strozzi Institute. He has um, spent about four decades researching, developing, and teaching somatics to number of, a number of business leaders, executives, managers, uh, teams for Fortune 500 companies. Uh, he was named one of the top 50 executive coaches um, he's written eight books, many of those I've read, such as Art of Somatic Coaching and The Anatomy of Change. Uh, he has his PhD in psychology, is a seventh degree black belt in Aikido, and was the advisor to the, uh, what was it, National Security Advisor to the Obama administration, administration. So with all of that in his background, I'm really pleased to like, turn this conversation over to Richard. Richard, uh, thank you for making time to do this and have a chat with us about how to really take um, this moment and meet it with the kind of uh, centering and clarity that we can lead our professional lives and our teams well during this turbulence. Thank you, Salunas. Thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, good oh, dark 30 to all of you. Um, so in part of my bio, what I want to say is I have a personal best today. My personal best today was consecutive days alive. So I'm really happy to be with you in that kind of a way. It's, it's good to be alive and we're all alive right now. And we're alive inside of this um, historical moment that is not provincial or regional or parochial at all, but it is really global. And um, I want to do really hats off to all the first responders and people being on the front lines, those that are ill and those that um, have suffered losses during this time. And having said that, that I think that this, this moment is really an opening for us at the same time. And, um, that while we have our hearts open and compassionate to all those other things that are happening and could even happen to us, that we start to go, what is this? What the, 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 the virus uh, is not a, um, uh, you know, it's framed in the metaphor of combat or war or battle. And this is really a fatigued old fashioned metaphor that's being used. And um, let me suggest that we really look at it as, um, there, the heat that, that, as a friend of mine said, King COVID, or another friend said, Queen COVID, um, is really a, uh, a possibility to looking at um, where we've gone off the line and astray, and where we can open into um, as if there's no back. We're not going back. We're not going back to a normal. We're going to back, going forward into some greater mystery and possibility. And um, that being said, let's, um, let's all get present in a way that most of you know through Strozzi of um, uh, coming into our bodies, inhabiting our bodies, which is inhabiting ourselves in a centering way. Stay seated if you wish. Um, if not, go ahead and stand. I'm going to stand. And Let's just take a moment and just be with ourselves, dropping in to ourself here as we're sitting or standing and, and feeling, just feeling what is there. Not trying to shift anything. 
I'm not trying to do a critique of anything, but just noticing how you are on these two legs, your head's on top of your shoulders, your shoulders are over your hips, hips are over your knees, your knees are over your feet. So we stand in this vertical line or you're sitting in this vertical line. This is the human line, human line of dignity. And while we're standing here, let's just check these usual suspects where we'll start to tighten or contract around ourselves, um, which would be the eyes, relax your eyes. If you've never done that before, think of coming behind your eyes and softening that. It doesn't mean blurring your vision, but you will notice if your eyes are more relaxed that the peripheral vision will open. And um, everything that I'm going to say about relaxing, about settling into ourself is really how the design of the human body is. Um, the second place is relax the jaw at the hinge and at the chin. And the system's designed that the teeth never have to touch. And check your tongue your, so your tongue's not pressing against the roof of the mouth or against the back of the teeth. The tongue's relaxed. That allows the breath to come in, go out deeply, come in deeply as well as our voice. And let the shoulders drop on the shoulder girdle, the skeleton of the shoulder girdle. So the shoulders don't have to hold up the shoulders. The shoulds, as we impress upon ourselves that we have to do, don't have to hold us up. Letting that mass, letting the muscular system relax on the bones. Let's drop into our abdomen and let the breath drop into the abdomen. So we're, while we're lengthening, almost as if we have a string at the top of our head like a puppet and we're being held straight in this way, we're also relaxing down. And one of the major things we want to relax down is our breath. What that means is that when you take an in-breath, the belly will go slightly out and out breath, it'll slowly, slowly come in. And we come down to the pelvic girdle. And so those sphincter muscles that control the, the genitals and the anus, let those relax. Let the sit, sit, uh, uh, cheeks, the sitting cheeks, the butt cheeks relax. Any of these, if you're not sure that that's happening, go ahead and tighten them. We drop down into the large muscles of the upper legs, of the knees. And again, think for a moment, the design is that the mass of the body, the muscular system rests on the skeletal system. Your knees are soft, spread your toes. So here in, in Asian traditions, we call this the ten chi, that we're the bridge between heaven and earth. Feet firmly on the ground. And we have a moral and spiritual vision for our life. That's our length. Now feel your balance in your feet left and right. So we're going to go to width, the width of our body. So you might sway back and forth and just come to that still point right in the middle where the weight is going down dropping into the feet, the toes are spread. Feel balanced at the knees and the hips. Really at the rib cage. Maybe if we take a deep breath, we'll feel the rib cage slightly going out, kind of like a book opening or a scroll opening. And our head's on straight. And even as we're starting to go out in our width, can you feel your clothes next to your body? Can you extend even further out into your room? Is there a plant there? What are their living forms? Plants, cats, dogs, fish, birds, children. The wooden table that's in front of me, I feel into that the life it had as part of an elm tree. And then extend to this group. We're going to spend this hour together. Extend to your loved ones. So the horizontal plane is our social plane where we're extending into the world. 
making boundaries, who we want to include in our inside of our sphere, who do we want to say, no, it's not appropriate to be any closer. And then our depth. And always good to start with the back body. The, uh, all of, so many senses in front, all of our machines being held in front. We're looking at a machine now. And drop into your back body. Back to your heels. The whole backs of the legs, kind of settling back and in, into yourself. Your low back. Feel those long muscles, paraspinalis and the muscles that go lengthwise in the spine. And think of your back as your history, places where you've been wounded, how you've healed that wounding, the love of your primary caregivers, those that you've lost, those new ones that have come into the world, your teachers, Rest back into your own experience, your own competencies. And then take your attention from the back body, let it move through the cavity of the torso and let it come into the front body and come right out to your belly center, just about three inches below your, below your belly button. So you come into your belly center your attention is dropped there. Come into your heart center. Come into your eye center. So the belly center, the center of action, intuition, will, And if it feels difficult to get there, you can just press your hands there from and feel the sensation of your hands at that level. Put your hands on your chest. So the center of compassion, goodwill, benevolence, benevolence, love, harmony. Then at the eye center, center of clear thinking, the mystery, long horizons of time. And however you think of it, like you're turning the switch, you're pressing a button, you're opening the door, turn on those centers, really come fully alive in your capacity to take skillful action. Come fully alive in your possibility for grounded compassion around compassion for all living things. We will have all have time here. We will abide here and then we'll pass away. We'll have joys. We will suffer. Open your heart to all living things that way. Then our eye center, the mystery, pragmatic wisdom, three billion years of evolution inside of this nervous system, inside of the spirit, that opens vast possibilities for us. And now for a moment, put your hand on your belly center. Maybe your thumb is in your belly button and you rest your palm. Right in the middle of your palm would be your center of gravity. Others, other cultures call this hara, tantian, kath. And said, this is where the energy gets held in us and where it gets distributed through the body. Keep your attention dropped, drop your hand to your side and speak one of your commitments to yourself. We have multiple commitments. But what is a commitment you have at this moment and perhaps spreading throughout your lifetime? What is your purpose? Thank you. Go ahead and take a seat if you're standing. Just notice here for a moment what mood that you this puts you in. 
And um, how we're going to move forward here is that I'm going to say a little bit more about the actual time and space that I'm talking to you from. And also, the, again, the recognition that we're living really in a pandemic and it's putting us in situations globally that we've never been in before, all of us living here. And that we have our hearts really tuned and trimmed to the right direction. In other words, how do we want to take care of ourselves, our loved ones, and those of us that have further reaches in your people in your business and taking care of them. And um, what I want you to know about me is that um, I'm very happy to report that my children, my grandchildren are all healthy. I'm healthy. My circle of loved ones are healthy. I am getting some reports from people who may be second, third tier outs that have um, spouses or partners and people in their business that have the COVID-19. Um, and that uh, Strozzi Institute is really affected by this, very, very much affected. We have a very, very strong, dedicated, committed team, and we are really all pulling at the same time. And we're, one thing, making a two-step or a turn into um, how do we keep everything going here um, in uh, uh, the virtual life. And um, so there's a high learning curve there's a place that we really are holding ground in uncertainty. And the same thing is happening for me at Two Rock Aikido and throughout the Aikido world too, where we're starting to move into the Zoom land and going, how do we build uh, these Aiki principles um, while we're staying at minimally six feet distance from each other? So um, I both go through the days with a um, tremendous amount of joy. And then there's these moments of like, mm, that's anxiety I'm feeling in my belly. Like, how, how do I, what do I do with that? Well, I know centering is the best medicine for that. And then looking ahead to how we move. So I'm going to stop there. And we talked about Salunas, you might want to ask me a couple of questions here in moving forward. Or should I just go? That's great. Thank you for leading that centering practice. Um, one of the things that I put into the chat was um, why we center. And maybe if you want to talk a little bit about the principle of that for those who are new and then how that is relevant or could be useful for our teams. And I mean, so many of us are really uh, connecting over computer screens and how do we hold sort of a collective center is the question. One thing to keep in mind that what we just did is um, starting to allow ourselves to relax in a dy dynamic way, not living in one interpretation of relaxation is what, what is it's Saturday afternoon and I'm laying on the couch drinking a Budweiser watching the game. That's all good, but we're talking about a different kind of relaxation dynamic relaxation in which our muscular system isn't in a constant chronic holding pattern or a gripping or a contracting even at the most smallest levels um, what we're doing is we're allowing our breath to drop down into the belly and we have a deep rhythmic breath and by moving our attention inside of the life of the body this is where we would say this is where we experience life is here and by moving our attention to the life of the body we're also moving from the thinking self to the feeling self and we are bringing forth a certain kind of rigor to not get caught up in the circularity of thoughts and worries and laments and revenge stories about the future or the past but we keep coming back to the present moment and one of the strongest ways to do that is coming back to the body we're coming back to sensation is what we're doing. Moving from the feeling self, moving from the thinking self to the feeling self. And that if we do this enough, if we do this enough, it'll become embodied. What does that mean? That means that when we're under some kind of threat, either real or perceived threat, and we feel the tightening, we feel ourselves going in our heads, uh, we, we're, we're contracted in some kind of way, one way or another, 
is then what we do is we then center ourselves. I've been doing a practice for a very long time. It's a meditation practice, but we could also say it's a centering practice um, since the late 1960s. And um, while I've had many quarrels with God, I realize that if I do my meditation practice, my centering practice is kind of like, at this point, like taking my Prozac. In other words, I enter into the world feeling more vital. Now, I want to say that is good medicine and that it's clinically impossible to be anxious when you're centered. In, the, in America, in the Diagnostic Psychiatric Manual, one of the things that they talk about being anxious is the breath is high and rapid. There's a low-grade contraction in the body, and we're running these circular thoughts over and over again. So as leaders leading our own life, leading teams, uh, leading companies, leading organizations, is that um, uh, what we're looking at is how do we actually then come into our environments in a way in which we're present, we're present to others, we're present to the environment. Um, we're open, we're open to the possibilities we're just not in a rigid stance about how the world should be or how it could be or what we're going to do. We can set our sail, we can be going in a certain direction, but we're also opening to changes in weather, changes in moods, changes in temperatures, changes, changes in how the conversation's rolling so that we know how to either really ground ourselves where we are or to begin to roll with those things. And that we're connected, we're connected to our set of principles. We could say somatically that from the waist down are our legs and our feet and our knees. We could say from the waist down is our base, our foundation, our ground. We can say from the waist down that we can ask ourselves then what is ground, what is ground, what is base, what is foundation. We can say that it's the principles that we live by the values that we live by and that um, we can actually then not just have those as a sticker on the refrigerator or something that comes up on your screen all the time, but something that we actually live. And that's what is the work that, as you all know, that we do at Strozzi Institute. How do we embody those values and those principles so that in our teams, if we come forward in a, um, uh, mood of being present and being present can say also say it doesn't mean I'm calm it could be that I'm upset and or I'm anxious we're, we're aware of those moods we're present with those moods we're here here and now with them or I have to fight something so I have to get a particular stance to fight for what I care about um, that's what mean being present is and we come in being open, we come in being connected. Um, I also want to say is that in the leadership conversation is that historically, especially in the West, um, especially in the West, I'll include Europe in that, and a lot of the more uh, in their places in all continents around this, is that we hold it as a, a an acceptance exceptional person, an exceptional man, or an exceptional woman. And I want to suggest to you that we really open up and engage in the conversation of that really it's a, a, a team of leaders. And we're really looking at a team of leaders. Um, I was reminded once by uh, uh, Stanley um, Crystal, who was a head of the forces in uh, Afghanistan, part of the time when I was there advising. And we were talking about uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, and he had just read one of his biographies. And both of us were struck by the same, one of the same things, which was that basically, you know, everybody will hold Dr. King up as that leader, but he really never led anything. He didn't lead, lead an organization. He didn't lead people. He represented that. But he had this capacity to bring 
um, all of these other people with him. And then by bringing them with him, being magnetizing their skills, their competencies, their moods, then he actually created a total movement. But we can't really say if you look formally what he was the leader of. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was an example of that, like who he brought around for his cabinet, that team of leaders. Um, when the, uh, the American President John F. Kennedy in the Bay of Pigs came up in the nuclear armaments down in Cuba, and he brought this tremendous team together that were also military experts, strategic experts, but he brought Charles Frost together, the poet, and he brought paint artists together and philosophers together, all so that in their area, he, they could have a view of the situation in hand and what had to happen. So essentially here I'm talking about how would we then have a team of leaders, a culture of leadership where everybody did these similar practices? Practice well, that's it. a great question. Um, we have one in the chat that really um, directly goes there. Uh, Christine shares, how do you translate this, uh, the centering practice when leading a team remotely at a time of high anxiety and challenges? Yeah, that's the question. That is the question. Uh, let me suggest this, Christine, is that you say, I want to tell you about a practice that I've been doing. And this practice has been useful for me in being able to keep my goals in mind, to be effectively in taking action, to keep my mood in the right place and to see possibilities that I might not have seen before. So you tell them what you've been doing and the value of it and the relevance of it. You have a narrative of relevance and then you say, this is a centering practice. And really to be present, open and connected, everybody in this call knows how to be centered, present, open and connected because you wouldn't be here if you weren't. But then you can say, let's all do this together, just as I did it with you virtually. And what I want to do is get everybody competent in this. We make commitments to doing this certain part, times of the day, and we start every meeting with it. We start every meeting with it. Um, the other great thing about the practice is that it's non equipment intensive. You don't have to do any have any um, uh, gear or to dress a certain way to center. So you can all do this. And you know, there might be some kind of people raising their eyebrows about it in the beginning or looking left and right, but more and more because of the advances around embodiment and mindfulness and meditation, many people are doing these practices. Does that answer that for you, Christina? I think I think that does. She <laughs> didn't pop in. But we have a question from Robert Kent that's a little bit more eso on the esoteric side. In Aikido, O Sensei spoke about performing techniques, the floating bridge of heaven, which seems to imply the state of clarity and the state in between, the normal day, the normal day-to-day -day life and the transcendent transcendental, I believe, reality. Where in the current situation does one look to find float, the floating bridge and the ideal state when act, which to act as one engages with colleagues over Zoom? Hi, Robert. Thanks, that was a mouthful me. there, Robert. <laughs> let, let me, uh, let me um, Robert, Robert runs a really great program for youth, Palestinian and, and Israeli youth in Aikido. And, um, we did a lot of work together in the uh, training across borders, the Mideast Aikido project. Um, but he, we use the word Osensei. Osensei means great teacher. That was the founder of Aikido, Morahai Washiba. Uh, before I go to the, um, the to the um, uh, my remarks uh, uh, around that, Robert, I want to tell you all the story. I started Aikido in uh, 1972 in Kauai, and there was actually some people in that dojo um, that had been there when um, O Sensei was there in 1969. And they were there really as, um, you know, 16, 17 year olds. And as I got to know them, they once told me a story that O Sensei said to them, you will never, you will never um, 
understand Aikido. In fact, you'll never understand the deep relevance of any martial art if you don't understand standing on the, the, the bridge, the, the, the floating bridge between heaven and earth. And these 16 year olds, he told me, he said, they looked at each other and went, what, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> I have no idea. I came here to be able to throw somebody, and I have no idea. So he said, what we did is we went back and trained. So basically, the, the, the piece is um, uh, the notion, number one is find a practice that you can train in that both has pragmatic value in how you show up in the world and how you show up with other people and other living things and also hold a spiritual, spiritual outlook. So really, Robert, my answer to your question is, I don't know. But the inquiry that I have for all people, leaders, is leaders have a practice that is grounded in how they show up in the world that embodies their values. And they began to see a bigger picture just than just their term of office and they begin to collect people into a team of leaders. And so Lunas, is it possible? I'd love to have, um, if possible, if they could actually, I could see their face when they ask a question. Absolutely. Uh, so Isabel, uh, would you like to ask your question directly? Hi, Richard. Hi, Nicole. You know, nice to see you. Um, Richard, one of the things I'm curious about is with all the trend and expert in marketing, branding, telling us we're going to a low touch world and we're not going to be the same. Where do you, which one of the three center do you believe it's crucial to start developing now in ourselves, in leaders we serve and also teams so that we are able to navigate that without losing the humanity um, and the, you know, that connection that we need. You know, Isabella, I, I would thank you for the question. I would really look at this really from the point of view of that we don't necessarily have to put one of these centers together. One of the things that we would hold is the power of the human being is a sense of unity, that it's in this form in which we are thinkers, we're actors, we're emotional beings, we have moods, we have visions of the future, um, we have a history, and it's all right in here. And that by really being in contact with these three centers at the same time, is that I think from our point of view, that's what really gives us power. And I think that once we contact there, that in the situation that you're in, it will be revealed like, oh, which, which part do I want to have come more forward now? Is that my heart center? Is that my action center? Is that my view, my uh, view of the world? You're welcome. And we have a question for, from Peter Durney, Denny, Denny, Peter? Peter Denning. Oh, you want me, want me to? Uh, so, Richard, uh, Zoom is good for conversations. And I have students who I'm trying to teach somatic um, principles to, and I'm stuck in Zoom, and I'm trying to find a way to use the conversations we could have in Zoom as a way of having them become more somatically aware. Do you have any guidance on that? Well, I'll tell you that I've been doing Zoom for some time now, mostly one-on-one -on -one coaching and then some groups. But right now, I have a very high learning curve. Uh, the other day, yesterday it was, I did a, um, I led people through somatic practices from about 50 countries, and there were a thousand of them. Um, so the time, the time has come, and uh, it has, and, and the, your question is very, very relevant. And... There's a couple of things. And as you know, we want to, first of all, build a narrative of relevance. Why do we want to do these somatic practices? Um, so that people have a relevance for this time of uncertainty um, uh, and chaos and ambigu ambiguousness. 
we have that. And then it really is like in the centering, talking about human beings, like all living organisms have those four dimensions, length, width, depth, and an organizing principle. Bodily, the organizing principle is the center of gravity. In the deeper place, the organizing principle is our purpose. So we want to bring the attention from the thinking self to the feeling self. That's the main thing. So if, what one of the things that I, I would do as we're sitting here, I would say to people, can you drop your attention to your sit bones? And, and it really goes, can you bring your hands together and feel them touching? Can you feel where the breath moves in and out of the body? And that is really the starting place. And the starting place for, I'm going to recognize that all the messages that I think just start up here, there's, there's a thing called the vagus nerve that goes into the belly around the heart and lungs. And there's all kinds of messages that come up this way. And that really in many ways represents 3 billion years of, um, uh, 3 billion years of uh, evolution. So that's kind of the quick and easy um, uh, message, a strong story and narrative about relevance, start really at a basic level. And what I will tell you that, you know, when I started doing this and first introduced meditation, people look cross-eyed at me. We change it to attention training, but now um, mindfulness has really taken part and it's even very digestible for people to go, Oh, it's a mindful practice to be mindful of what your body's doing. What is the shape of it? What's the gestures of it? Is that at all helpful, Peter? Yeah, can I ask a follow-up on that? Uh, just, uh, I know that for this, a lot of us have to deal with conditioned tendencies. Yes. And maybe that we can certainly, uh, you know, arouse an awareness of conditioned tendencies in conversations. So that might be a, a, a way of getting them more somatically aware is to become aware of conditioned tendencies that they have. That's right. Beautiful. Uh, we have a question from Margaret McIntyre. Margaret? Hi, Richard. It's wonderful to see you and be with you. I've been hanging out for the last few weeks with you. It's wonderful. Thank um, you. I found out that my mother's uh, assisted living has about 20% of the uh, people with COVID and three of the um, staff. They're going to retest in a week. Um, my mother was negative. She's getting more confused. She has some dementia, which is why she's there. Um, I'm trying to be centered in the knowing that it could I, I have a friend who whose mother died very quickly in a couple of couple of days of getting diagnosed i just wondered if you have any thoughts of how to hold the reality of the risk and not fall into um too much projection you know how to stay present with it mm -hmm. and knowing my mother's going to be she's going to be 89 in a couple of weeks if she makes it and uh Something's, you know, she's getting older and, you know, is likely going to die of something. I don't know um, how to, you know, I want to protect her from the suffering and I, I, I want to be with her, which I can't and things. So I'm finding myself in a bit of pain. Yeah. I'm sorry you're in pain. I hope your mother's not in pain or something. <laughs> um, it, this is a very relevant question for me. In the last six months, I've had three people very close to me who um, have passed on. And with uh, two of them, I was very close. I was there in that moment. And um, they, were, they were unbelievable models to how to go into that mystery. Unbelievable models. And as much as I didn't want them to be in pain or to suffer, is that I, what was left to me was to fully and completely and authentically love them and continue to tell them that I love them. And, um, uh, you know, I, it, it's something that we will all face personally. It's, I know that many of you out there have faced it in this kind of a way too. 
And I would say also, you know, that I was, I was leading a Zoom Aikido class. We were doing mostly these Qigong, Pao Kua movements, internal martial arts. And all of a sudden this wave of, wave of um, grief hit me and it went back from eight months ago. So um, Lee, I, I just want to um, counsel you if you're open to it, just to stay really open to your grief and let it have room. It's just such a deep, deep part of us being human. It opens up to other places. And, you know, really in that those of you that um, have people in the workplace like this and people you might be coaching, really open up that um, the, the, the upset in this world where it could be really as, as marked as somebody you know and love dying to the way that we're going to be living is dying, is finishing. And when all that loss is there, what comes out of us is grief. And, and make that possible for the people in the workplace can be able to step outside or if they feel safe enough to, to share it inside too. I wanted to make one other quick comment about somatics over Zoom. Um, what people will miss is the grab and the two-step of blending the energy when you're really there. That was something that um, you impressed upon me years ago that I never forget. <laughs> that that's something I think about and and use in my think you know in my thinking with others a, a lot. So I just wanted to say. I'm sorry, people will miss the the grab. <laughs> I'm going to invent it. I'm going to invent a virtual grab. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. You're welcome. Uh, Richard, we have another question that's in the chat. Um, can you speak to specific uh, stressors that um, happen to teams? Like, if a team is in breakdown, how do you reorient them during this time? When when you when you see a a, a members of your team or the team itself in a breakdown, the first thing you want to do is declare it. Really bring it out in the open. And what we want to think of the breakdown is, is the breakdown is an interruption in the flow of commitments. So we have in our lives this flow of commitments that has been totally under interrupted. And I saw somebody in the chat said, what is a grab? I'll say that's a grab and I'll go back to that. Um, but what happens is then we have this breakdown because the way that we've structured the world, the world's not acting in accordance with that anymore. And essentially we start to ask like, then what do I do or how do I do it? or Who do I do it with? Or why would I do these things? All those things that were in place before and the most powerful thing you can do in the beginning is you say, this is a breakdown that we're in. And ground why you say that. Ground it in the actions, the moods, the emotions, the way the relationships are configured so people can see it. And you do that not like finger wagging or I've caught you, anything like this. You, 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 you declare it in a way where you go, and this is also an opening. Now, and the first thing we want to do in that breakdown is we want to bring ourselves back to the present moment. Some people who have had a lot of trauma in their life, we've all had some kind of trauma. Theirs may be deeper and it's harder for them to unlock it. And you might have to be longer with somebody like that. Um, but you have to, as leaders, we begin to read people distinctly from each other, distinctly from even the group body, and begin to give them the space or the, the operational distinctions or the actions for, for that, for what they, can, what they can do to come back. That coming back, we can call resilience, the, the snap back. Sometimes we get thrown off and it's harder and harder to come back. At my stage of life, I see people close to my age that are starting to go off and I go, gee, they're not going to come back. They've gone off in this way. They're not going to come back. So we have to first say, there's a breakdown. I'm off here. The other thing is to bring inside of the team conversation is the um, researchers inside of resilience. Um, 
uh, well, there's been a lot of research, but we can say that a lot of, lot of the, the medicine for resilience falls in either four or five buckets. And one is there will be a group of people that will find resilience in nature. And it may be like, let me just, I was going to say, let's step out and go to the park. Maybe we can't even do that anymore. But how do you find nature? Maybe you have a plant in your house, or maybe you have your backyard you can go into. You know, when we start to find some space around this, go out to the seashore. Um, there are people that find their resilience in art, art, music, poetry. Find a text or a piece of poetry that when you read it, you go, oh, right, I'm coming back to really who I am in this moment, and settled in this moment. Or I can look at this photograph or I can look at this painting that's on my walls or have that around for yourself. You can even bring that up on your screen too. Um, the other, another thing is people will find resilience in animals, your cats, your dogs, birds. People will find that some people have fish. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've seen and been with so many people that look at the YouTubes about funny stories with dogs and people just will start to open up and get present again. Just see the funny things. We can't go out with our dog now or we don't have a cat and see those funny things that it brings something up in us that strikes deep, deep in our spirit. And fourth is that, um, uh, that we have a spiritual view. We, we, we recognize that there's something beyond the self. There's something that's beyond Richard. I'm taking up space, I'm taking up time, but there's something that is beyond the self, you know, and people have many, many different names for that. Um, <clears throat> if that's new to you, you can really just start by feeling coming into your body as we described, move from the thinking to the feeling self and feel the space around you. Just take a moment of being quiet and feeling the space around you. You know, somebody today asked me how I was and I said, you know, where I am on the ranch, I really feel a settledness and a calmness. And there's a way that uh, actually different and more birds are showing up here and animals. And outside of that, I can feel the hum of the panic. I can feel the hum of the anxiety. But whatever it is you're feeling is that just going, there's something more. Maybe it's nature. Maybe it's in the belief of something. Maybe it is this primal energy that animates who we are. This thing called energy or ki or chi or Elan Vital. The other thing is... Um, other beings, other human beings. And if it's appropriate in the spaces you're in with, with them, give them a hug. Get out of yourself. Tell them what you appreciate about them. Tell them what you, 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 what you love them for. If your team is meeting virtually, you can say after you center, everybody go around, we'll pick one person and give them, a, give them an acknowledgement. Tell them what you appreciate. Tell them what you appreciate about them. And all research really will basically fall in those five buckets. And the more that we train ourselves to do that, the more resilience we'll actually have, the more re easily resourced we will become. Thank you for that, Richard. I, I know you saw the question about what is a grab, but we also have a question from Alan Gelman around uh, how do you engage with clients in somatic practices when they are focused on immediate concerns and operate from the head and resist the, the woo-woo stuff? Mm -hmm. Did I get that I, right, I, Alan? Yes, thank you for bringing that to the center, uh, Nicole. And, uh, and Richard, I'm here in the Lakeshore area of Oakland and got to be uh, with you yesterday with the coaches rising. So thank you for that and for doing this weekly uh, very much. So, uh, and I'm curious about when people are in their heads and having trouble getting out of it because they're trying to focus on something very important and meaningful and urgent and immediate. How do you help them find their parts in their bodies when that's not a place they might normally go? 
You know, Ellen, you know, one of the things that I do when I start my client work is that I always start with um, a, a centering practice. And it may be an abbreviated one, but I say, you know, for us to begin our conversation so we're in our more adult space, and because of all this uncertainty and this chaos, well, we we'll revert to more our reactive space and kind of a younger self and we'll be reactive and anxiety will come up. So let's both go through this. And um, I'll say, so I'll, let's just both take a deep breath together. Let the jaw relax. Let's feel our back. And I'll go through all those places together with them. And, um, uh, and I'll say, if you're comfortable, close your eyes. And, at that, and then at the end of it, and this might be two or three minutes. And then just say, when you're ready, go ahead and open your eyes. We'll both say our mood, and then let's begin. Thank you for that, Richard. Do you want to describe what a grab is? Yes, a, a, a grab is one of the ways, one of the things that we can use for ourselves is this notion of humans being historical beings. And what we would say, the sum total of all of our conditioning in our history actually lives in our tissues. It lives in our organ correspondence. It lives in our tissue metabolism. It lives in our behaviors and all of our actions. And that when we are in front of a real or perceived threat, all of us, if you have a human nervous system, Will, will precipitate back to those old practices that kept you alive. They kept you alive between usually the ages between one and seven or one and nine. These are our conditioned tendencies. If we're not aware of those conditioned tendencies, fight, flight, freeze, disassociate, move against pe people, move towards people, move away from people, is that we won't make the choice to center. Those things I told you came from Darwin. They came from psychology. We've known them for a long time. But the beauty of somatics and embodiment is those actually live in, with us. So my shoulders are up like this. I'm holding my shoulders up. You can see me. And somebody says, how are you? And I say, I'm great. I'm fine. Well, you go, what's coming out of your mouth and what your body doing is two different things. So the grab, we've had the grab where you will have, give somebody, a partner, the same that can trigger you most and then grab their wrist. And what that will usually do while you say it and grab them, will put them into that condition tendency. And in that conditioned tendency, they get a real close look of what that is. And then that's a very powerful, powerful, vital reminder that if I say I'm fine, and I may think that in my head, that I'm actually not fine. What I'm moving towards is fear. When people get afraid, they raise their thing. If I, my shoulders are like this, I may go, I'm not resigned, but I'm predisposed to resignation. And I can feel and see that in my body. That gives you the choice to then begin to take the action of bringing yourself back to the present moment, bringing yourself back to here. Thank you, Richard. We have a question from Kimberly Woodland, and I'm I'm going to put some context around this, Kimberly. Um, Richie, you've coached a number of um, business leaders, especially in the tech world. And so I know that sometimes when you're talking to those who are oriented to their computers or into technology that they hold, sometimes hold more beliefs around their thinking selves. Um, so with that, uh, Kimberly, I'm going to add your question. How do you describe um, to others the advantage of moving from the thinking self to the feeling self? What we're doing by going to the feeling self is we're engaging a whole other part of our brain and a whole other part of our nervous system. So most people will, can think of that in terms of, yes, I wanna use my full brain, I wanna use my full nervous system. And when we cut off or we prune out that part of our being, 
our sensory part, our, our capacity to feel, to empathize, to, to sense, um, to intuit, um, to be relational in a, a way with other people in which we feel and can actually work inside of that connection. That allows us to coordinate more effectively with others. It, it allows us to see possibilities that weren't possible for us. It, it gives us the opportunity to go, oh, why people aren't moving in my request or in my declarations because they don't trust me. In other words, they don't feel me feeling them or taking in their care or their considerations. So really, Kimberly, it's saying we activate the, the, the part of the uh, nervous system we call the vestibular system, the vagus nerve, that are kind of the basement or the foundation of our livingness in our sensory part of our nervous system at the same time. And our, our have them come to Strozzi Institute. <laughs> Good idea, Richard. Thank you so much. Hi, Kimberly. Hi. Hi. I work in healthcare, as you know, and so um, I need something, a, a, a good quick way to explain to people why we want to do this. So um, I appreciate all the help I can get. Thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. Let me just add on here to you and to everybody is that I am so grateful for the work in neuroscience because it grounds what we know about somatics. It just grounds it. I also reject most of the language because it's in that scientific mode of, I divide things in half, I divide things in, you know, I'm going back till there's not a self there anymore, a real person that I'm working with. And also it gives the appearance, it doesn't mean to, but I think it gives the appearance that all, it's all up here, it's gonna take care of everything down here. And it's kind of like, if I think this through, and that puts us into the appearance, if I think this through, I'll know how to act which it doesn't, yeah. So we have time for one more question and that's uh, Tamara. If you would like to ask your question before uh, we begin to wrap up this conversation. Hi, Richard. Hi, Tammy. Uh, my question is about um, when you were saying stepping outside of yourself and giving people a hug if somebody's close to you, right? How, you know, having that connection with somebody in this time. What about those of us who, I mean, I can't touch people. I live alone. I can't go out and give somebody a hug. Um, so what is the mechanism by which I can get that same sort of spiritual connection with somebody that you would get with that good chest to chest strozy hug when I can't actually touch you? How do I build that pathway or that mechanism. And that could work both in a workspace or from here to you. How do we do that? So get yourself present, open and connected, get yourself centered. Yeah. And when you're there, just go ahead and nod your head. Make sure the jaw is relaxed. Yeah. Drop your attention down to your heart center. Okay, you ready? <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Richard. Uh, something like that. Something like that, Tammy. <sighs> Thanks for taking it in. Thank you uh, for doing that, Richard. That was uh, really meaningful uh, to me and I'm sure for everyone else in the group. I see a couple of people saying, uh, was that for all of us? And that they all uh, could feel and breathe. So thank you for extending. Absolutely, yeah. And it's so great to see so many faces really from way back to and um, love you all. Uh, so I just wanted to, um, as we have a couple of minutes before everyone uh, begins to jump off the call, we have a, a, a few things to announce um, that's happening at Strozzi Institute. Um, Richard, you spoke a lot about resilience um, just a few moments ago and some practices. Um, we do have a course that will be led by Stacy K. Haynes, uh, which is six sessions. Can you, everyone hear me? Which is six sessions beginning on May 12th called Cultivating Resilience. 
I'm putting this in the chat so that everyone will have the link to that. Um, also on May 12th, Richard and Stacy will be holding another chat, um, which is meeting the moment. And so you will go deeper into some more practices there. And for those of you who are looking to practice with us uh, in person, we're hoping that the curve flattens, right? Um, I know that we're in extraordinary times and we don't know, but um, if the curve does flatten and if we are able to travel, we will have School of Embodied Leadership uh, this July. So we'll have all of this in the chat for you all. Um, with that, Richard, anything you want to leave this group with? Yes, I want to read a poem. Title of this poem is called Yes. Yes, and it's by a, an American poet named William Stafford, S-T-A-F-F-O-R-D. He's passed, and um, I always like to tell the story about William Stafford, who's a brilliant poet, and um, he would write one poem a day, uh, get up in the morning, write it, go through it, and then that would be it. And most poets, they'll can have anywhere from 500 to 1,000 renditions of it. And somebody asked him, how can you just write one poem? And that was it. And he said, I lowered my standards. So <laughs> I, I love that story. So all you perfectionists out there, yeah, I don't say. He, he, this is yes, this is what he wrote. It could happen any time. It could happen any time. Tornado, earthquake, Armageddon. It could happen. Or sunshine, love, salvation. It could, you know. That's why we wake up and look out. No guarantees in this life. But some bonuses, like morning, like right now, like right now, like noon, like evening. It could happen any time, tornado, earthquake, Armageddon. It could happen, or sunshine, love, salvation. It could, you know, that's why we wake up that's why we wake up and look out and look out. No guarantees in this life, but some bonuses like morning, like right now, like noon, like evening. Okay, take it easy, but take it. <laughs>